Hello, welcome to today's webinar on visual content and how to produce content, manage it, and talking a bit about images on the websites. And um, I usually start by introducing the image that's behind me. Um, when I'm not doing digital stuff, um, sometimes I'm building sculptures. Um, this was a pitch that I did for Rainbow Serpent and got that large art grant. That's been cancelled, so it's half built. Um, however, I've been um, the, there's the actual renderings, and we um, I'm repitching it for some other festivals. So I put together a run sheet with all my webinars uh, that that allows you to follow through the run sheet, but it also allows you to to as a resource when you're using it later, so you know whereabouts in the video to skip to, so you don't have to um, watch the whole thing looking for the bit. And also I'm referencing all my links and all the information um, that, that I'm referencing there. So it's easy for you to get to. So let's get started. Okay, so this is a subset of content marketing. And I did a webinar last Friday on content marketing. And I, so I recommend you, you uh, watch that in conjunction with this one because the image, image content is just a subset of a bigger picture content strategy. So I talked a bit about in that webinar about um, producing content, managing it, thinking about it, that sort of stuff. So uh, yeah, please watch that in context to this webinar. Um, but just as a brief intro, content underpins all of your marketing and communications. If you don't have any content, you, you can't be running an Instagram account or Facebook account. Uh, without content, you can't be uh, running, building a website. Um, without content, you can't be connecting, with, communicating with your audience. So I'll go through that in a lot more detail in the, the last webinar. So I'll skip that for the people who have been to, to, this web, to that webinar. I'm going to just jump straight into images because we're, this webinar is about specifically about image-based um, content. And why are images so important? Well, if we start from a scientific background or an evolutionary point of view, the eye during human evolution, when the eye evolved to be able to see single cell, multiple cell images, then it accelerated uh, evolution. Uh, and so in that context, it's such a key tool that, that uh, we as animals use. We also have a large part of our brain called the visual cortex that's dedicated to visual stimuli. So we have whole, these um, amazing organs that helped evolution and then a big chunk of our brain to process those images. So it's a pretty key part of uh, human, being a human um, is visual. Now it's um, a language. So uh, visual, visual design is a language in itself. So if you think of uh, the written language, uh, sentence structure, um, different words, etc., it's the same thing with visual language. And this language is, if you study uh, visual communications, so graphic design or visual arts, a big part of that training is actually teaching you this language. Now, the good news is you don't need to go to school to learn this because you're human and we learn this from, well, we're pre-programmed with it. And then as babies, we can communicate in visual ways. And then we learn as we, as we grow up, um, visual communication. Uh, the other interesting thing, um, also talking about humans with visual content, is that we also have another language in there and that's body language. So humans have a complex way of um, communicating emotions um, through our facial expressions and our body language. Uh, and that also is worth learning in that construct to images um, and using images on, in your content. Um, there's a book I've got linked to on the run sheet called The Essentials of Visual Communication. Uh, that's a graphic design textbook, um, which talks about a lot of lot of the actual more details about elements and, and things. Although we've only got two hours to run through this, so I'll be keeping all the points brief. Just the idea is to give you an introduction to things and then from there um, you can look, look into more detail. I also do really recommend going to the library um, and getting out some graphic design books. Now you can get some really advanced ones which might be a bit complex, but then there's, there's usually uh, quite simple ones. And the great thing about graphic design books is they used to have pictures. Um, we like, re like reading with pictures. 
Uh, so it's not as a heavy a read as um, a lot of nonfiction. So I really recommend that you go out, get some books, start learning graphic design, AKA visual language. And you may even delve into um, more fine arts um, side of things. Because this is key, that visual language is key to using visual um, medium on, on, on the websites and using it to communicate. It's not just a pretty picture, it is actually uh, a communic form of communication. Uh, and again, in previous webinars, I've talked about the importance of storytelling and again, the importance of storytelling in human evolution and knowledge transfer and how we're wired for story. And there's a lot of uh, story that can be told just even through one picture, one photo. Obviously, video is a much more powerful uh, medium for storytelling. Uh, we can also portray a lot of emotion uh, and also aesthetics to our graphics. So it's really interesting to look at uh, what images, what story they're telling, and also how can we elicit emotion. Another reason that images are so important to web design and graphic design is its quick comprehension. So we can put a series of images that can tell our story, uh, explain what's happening really quickly so that someone, when they first load the web page, can have a quick understanding of what's happening, even if that's at a subconscious level. And then you back that up with uh, obviously the, the text and supporting information. And then that jumps through to, um, you know, your more information. However, the images can really tell a, a huge story before you even um, get started. And remember, if someone loads a website, they're only going to give you less than a second or maybe a few seconds if you're really lucky to to get what you're doing. I mean, if, they're, if they've come to your website with intent, then they'll stay and you can afford to be forgiving. However, if they've just bounced to your website, say through a link on social media or a referral from a friend, they're not going to stay there long and you've got to quickly get their attention and communicate as quick as possible. And images are key for that. Okay, so next I'll move on to image strategy. And image strategy is a subset of your brand personality. Um, so in the first webinar that I taught, I was talking about um, digital strategy. Now digital strategy is a subset that sits underneath your organizational or campaign strategy. So first you need an organization and a campaign strategy. What are we trying to do? Um, uh, then there's a lot of books and videos on, on that. That's, that's a whole, whole series of webinars. Then under that, you have your digital strategy. So how does digital support what you're trying to do as an organization in your campaign? Then under that, we have our um, image strategy, which then also, well, it sits side by side because it supports your digital strategy, but then also supports your main strategy. And one thing I'm really keen to get across in these webinars is to think strategically about what you're doing. Uh, then don't just jump in because you've got limited resources and if you're thinking strategically, then you're more likely to uh, get return on, or be effective or win your campaign. Um, so I'll leave it at that. I'll let you go back to the previous webinars and talk about brand personality and strategic communications. Um, but in a summary, what that is, is working out what personality your brand has, or like what imagery do you use, what type of, um, language do you use, all those sort of things. It's important also to choose imagery that fits your message. And again, you, you need to be working out what your messaging is and then figure out what, what imagery is going to work with that messaging. And then a back to storytelling and emotion, which is a real key thing um, that we can do with images. Okay, so we wanna start with this is to have, oh, well, we want to start with our strategy. So once we've got the strategy in place, uh, we want, and as, as far as examples, they're actually far, very few and far between. Um, and I really recommend that it's not really, not important how good your strategy is or you know how complete or professional. It's just important to start putting one together because it forces you to think about the, the important things that I'm discussing. It also, forces other people in your organization to think about it. And it also allows you as an organization when people disagree or going, you know, I want to use this image or why are you doing that? They can always come back to your strategy and to your style guide. Now this is also an evolving document as well. Um, what you first do is your style, your style can change and shift. And we talked about campaign um, phases in early webinars. So your campaign may be a, 
a um, child, we're just launching a campaign. So your style may be quite different to um, next uh, the next level when you're an adolescent, you're growing the campaign a bit more, through to when you're a mature campaign. So your style can quite change. Your style guide also should come with a library. Um, uh, so that's a collect, you're starting to collect images that you can use. Now it's really key to have a library because then you can show, show people that you're working with, or oh, this is, if they don't sort of understand the words or description of the style guide, you can go, well, here are the images we're using. Here's some examples, and so that can make sense. Also, if you want to bump out a meme really quick this afternoon and you're like, I need to do a meme really quickly, you can jump to your library, grab an image, do up your meme, bump it out. So libraries are a really key part of um, your guide. Your image style should um, talk about your style. Now, the definition of style is um, can be quite elusive. Um, there's a lot of different um, ways of describe, describing your style. But I think maybe if you just think about your friends and how, how they dress. So what's the style of your various different friends or colleagues? Um, and this is, this is where sometimes um, some professional help can help you with getting details on your style. But even if you're just guessing and, and as I said, trying to move along, then that's really important. So also understand the quality of, of the images that you're using. This is part of your style guide. So professional versus amateur. So if you're a grassroots group and you're, um, you're asking for donations because you're completely broke and they've got these really rich polished images, sometimes that can actually counteract your quality. Sometimes it's actually better to have really lo-fi, um, low quality images, because that actually reflects your brand personality. Uh, there's, and by professional um, photography, I mean, you can always look at a photo and see, you, you can guess whether oh, that's a really good quality photo or not. And uh, that depends on the camera they're using, what lenses they're using, what lighting, and what resolution they're producing the images, amongst a lot of other elements. Uh, so the quality of images is also quite important. And the thing with a style, gu style guide and library is you want your style to be together. If you've got this mishmash of styles, it, they sort of look out of place together. And then when you put them on your website, it sort of looks out of place. So you really do want to have um, the, a cohesive look to your graphics. Uh, there's a big thing in the high-end Instagram influencer um, people where they actually got a very specific visual style um, so they might use certain color palettes and obviously the way they're using the camera and framing. So when you go to look at the Insta profile, it all looks unified and um, quite specific. Uh, so that, that's a lot of work to get to that point, um, but that's an example of using the image style guide for their branding. It also can involve treatment. So you would have seen Instagram filters or similar like, like that. Or you may, uh, if you're, um, a, camp a historical campaign, you may then grade historical filters over it to make the images look old, for example, or you may use black and white images, um, you know, treating them a certain way to keep them together. And um, shooting to black and white can is a powerful in a lot of ways. Your content and your subject, so who, what, why. So your, your style guide should be including what sort of things you include in your photos. So if you're an animal rights org, then you know, you'd be including animals. Etc. And illustration is also a really powerful um, approach. So in, in a minimal context, illustration could be just some um, flourishes or some little de design elements that then you can put through your imagery or through your graphics. Or it can be um, a major part of your communication. So you'll see um, some companies, um, we use like illustration of people or using their tools. We have a very illustrative style of their brand. We were looking at doing some work with the uh, Australian Children with Disability and we were discussing the implications of using public images of children and the, the impacts and that sort of stuff. And so one of the directions we looked at was to, okay, let's replace that with illustration. Now, when we're then going to use illustration, then we had to really be really tight with like, well, how are we going to illustrate them? You know, um, are we going to use more professional, more scribble based? I mean, how refined are we going to do them and, and all that sort of stuff? Um, it is actually quite complex to then brief in that context what illustration you use. Um, we ended up using photography with very strict usage guides. And I'll talk about that a little bit better.
Now this is uh, back to this point from um, Canva. So firstly, they're talking about graphic design. So that's your logo, colors, fonts. But I'm gonna jump down to more what I'm interested in here. Okay, so this is a good example of illustration being used for branding. And so you can see how they're using that graphic element throughout their design. Again, this one's using a minimal color, um, but how they treat the, the photography of the flowers, the illustration of the flowers. So if you put that through your whole brand, it really gives a really consistent feel. And Bunnings is another example. When you see all their products, they've got this like tight hand, like a drawing of all the tools and all the products. Now that's quite genius in context because they would have such a diversity of um, image styles coming in, photography styles coming in of the products. You'd have really um, professional, um, different professionals, but they'd all be shot in different studios, different approaches. So Bunnings would have this mishmash of uh, photography. So what they've done is they've just reduced them to line. Um, so that just keeps their style really tight. It also allows them to tidy up images and make them a little bit more illustrative. Okay. Um, so here's a descriptive one for style photography. And in that, when I said earlier, it's sometimes elusive. So in that case, as long as you're getting one out there. So this isn't necessarily meant to be right or wrong. So in this context, they're using words like mood. What are the main mood of the um, photography? What are the main principles? Um, how they're directing people, shooting people, locations. They want vibrant, vibrant culture, um, vibrant pictures. So that'd be vibrant colors, et cetera, et cetera. So that's an example there. Um, and then here we go, we've got some examples. So you can see that these photos sort of look or look right together. They're sort of shot, they're, they're not high end professional, but they're not also cruddy amateur. So they've sort of gone a mid range of um, that approach. And although you can see different styles through here, it's still enough of a cohesive to look right together. And if we put a really shiny SMIC photo in this, then it would look out of place. If we put a um, really dodgy lo-fi image in there, it would also look out of place. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about actually putting images on websites. Now, a really important thing is not to use carousels, sliders, tabs, and accordions. So sliders are those things that, um, you know, slide images like that. And this has been quite controversial in my whole career because I've always hated them. And I've always recommended never to use them. Now, now what's happening is we're getting a data and research coming back saying that um, they don't work and that people don't like them. The thing that I don't like about them, uh, well, there's a few things I don't like about them. First, when you first come to a website, You've, that you've not been before is you're, you're looking at so many things trying to process it. You're looking at the logo, who are these people? You're looking at the menu, or where should I go? The information that's in front of you. And then you're going boom to people. It's really annoying and it's really hard for people to be able to focus. Um, it also means they're missing information. So they might go, oh, that was a really good, uh, uh, and you're just confusing them. Also with uh, mobile phones, uh, sliders and that don't work very well on mobiles, which is more of a scroll format. And we should be designing for both desktop and mobile. Use images to illustrate concepts. Um, so show how people are doing something. So if you're a land care organization, show people working and caring for the land. If it's an animal rescue, then you'll, you'll be able to show people actually rest like nursing animals or um you know feeding them those sort of things show context to what you're doing so in that context you're thinking like how can we ex really quickly tell the story of what we do and how we do it and then how can we use photography and then choosing those shots that will actually reinforce what you're doing you want to have a point of focus so your eye will be drawn to somewhere on the website um on your image and I'm going to show, talk through some um, examples. I'm going to deconstruct some websites in a little bit. And um, it's important. So, for example, if you've got a call to action there, you actually want your image to sort of focus more towards that. Only use relevant images. So don't use images just because. Uh, so, for example, my action skills website, I'm using a method called rapid prototyping. So I'm, I'm building this website as I'm, I'm launching it and as I'm running the webinars. 
Now, I haven't been able to do the work that I'm describing in this webinar. Therefore, I'm not, I don't have any images on my website. I'd rather have a complete blank website with nothing on it as far as imagery, even though imagery is so powerful and I'm banging on about it today, rather than use the wrong imagery. Um, because as well as imagery being um, reinforcing you, it can also undermine you. So I'm, um, I'm in the process of doing this work that we're um, talking about at the moment. So I, I prefer not to use a photo. The other benefit of um, not using images is you'll get a faster speed um, so if they're not a relevant image, you're actually then increasing, increasing your speed, uh, you're decreasing the website speed. So therefore, you, it's really bad. Contrast is really key. Um, so especially if you're putting text over it so that you can actually read it. Uh, contrast is the, how dark and light an image is. So in the context image behind me, um, putting text across that just wouldn't work because it's just too detailed. Whereas if I put text up um, above the head there, it's quite high contrast, the green. So therefore I could put some white text and it would stand out quite bright over the top there. Uh, emphasize your call to action. So I assume that in your web design that you want someone to do something. And we talked about this a lot in earlier webinars. So therefore you have a call to action. So sign up here, donate here, do something, come to an event. So you, you want to use imagery to actually reinforce those call to actions. And also, again, back to illustrating a concept, if it's an event, then you may have a photo of a previous event. So therefore, people can see, okay, the call to action go to an event, and then they can see what an event may look like. Now, this is more of a corporate approach, but it'll give you an idea. So seven visual marketing persuasive factors for a hero shop. So by hero, uh, usually this is the main important image on a website. So you wouldn't see it these days. Generally, it's at the top, like a massive image. Um, so the, he's, uh, this author is saying, keyword relevance. So is this relevant to your keywords? We did search marketing in the previous one. The purpose of your, your page or your, your the page you're talking about. So we want clarity on that. You want to support the design process of what you're trying to communicate. Is this an authentic image that represents you? Um, you want to add value to what you're doing. Emotion. Um, is this an emotive shot? You want to try and elicit emotions. And, and bonus points is if you can actually make the customer or the visitor the hero in that. And I'll let you go through that in uh, your own time. But they'll give you a snapshot of how, how to think about that in that context. Okay, so... I want to talk about people because people is really important part of visual communication. Um, and it's also really important to use uh, picture, uh, pictures of people because the studies and research have shown that people respond a lot better to um, images of people. And again, we've got a whole another part of our brain uh, as far as, as in addition to the visual um, processor is actually to recognize faces um, and that side of things. So some, a uh, bit of a discussion on um, using people in photography in, in websites and social. Show real people. This should be common sense, but you want to show um, actual real people doing the real things. You want to avoid fake stock people. Um, and you would see, um, you would come across a website where they've used obvious stock photography. Um, it's coming from America. Um, it just, has it, it just looks wrong it looks fake and whatever you do don't you like use there's a lot of business um stock people shaking hand in suits and really lame stuff you want to avoid that um like the plague because people will just then assume that what you're doing is fake a subconscious level and it'll just make make what you're doing fake again sometimes it's better not to use an image than to use um a cheesy fake stock image and in that context, then you can get creative in producing images. And hopefully I'll go through today um, ways to do that. Uh, use faces of visual cues. So all the emotions in faces, you can actually show that through um, what image you choose. It's also, um, you can direct people. So for example, if this was a web design and my call to action was on top of that wing, I could have my picture like this. So when you look at me coming on, you'll look at my face, you'll see my eyes, and then you'll look at where I'm looking. 
because it's quite normal for humans when they see a human look at something that they'll look as well. So that way you can use the face to actually um, point to your call to action or to control the flow of the um, page. It's important um, to show diversity and representation in our images. And uh, this is for in an NGO, not for profit context, but I think it's really important in a corporate environment as well. And this is starting to happen. Um, but when I first started getting into graphic design, um, pretty much all the ads were white people, um, white, middle class, educated people. Um, that was it. All advertising, white people. Now, Australia is a very multicultural country, and that's just simply a lie. Um, and also, um, it's essential for, um, as not for profits, to actually engage with diversity, um, engage with diverse people, because the amount of wealth and um, um, value they can bring is just immense. And a lot of the times, the issues that we're actually campaigning on directly affects people of colour or people of diversity. So it's really important that they're, they're represented um, and that they're involved. And gender diversity is also a really key um, attribute. Uh, there's, there's lots of literature on, um, feminist literature on women represented in media um, and the gender gaps, et cetera, et cetera. So it's also key for us to um, start showing um, more true representations of the balance of uh, male, female, and also alt gender and queer folk as well. And that's really important to um, also include diversity in, in other areas. Um, I'm just gonna jump to an article uh, and talk about the pros and cons of the article, which is talking um, about the attractiveness bias. So this, this article is framing some research which pretty much says that attractive people, more people are more biased to images of attractive people. Um, and so if you put an attractive person in your ad and, and by attractive, I'm talking about just a stereotype definition in society. And again, that's a whole thing to be deconstructed, but attractive people, um, will sell more products, will engage people and get more attention. They'll get away with, um, they'll get more likely to get away with crimes and et cetera, et cetera. Um, the other, um, thing that this author is explaining exploring is how um, crops, how faces are more cropped. Um, and so the image on the left is more how men are cropped in imagery generally, and the one on the right is how women are cropped more, more generally. Uh, and that has, uh, there's, there's a lot of um, communication even in that crop. Um, and also the baby face bias. So this is, you know, more of the puppy dog eye looks or the, the cutie stuff of babies. Um, so that can be very emotively connecting, but it can also undermine authority, et cetera, et cetera. So I'll let you read this article um, in your own time. Um, however, this baby face bias is interesting um, when used with animals, if, um, because, you know, pictures of cute puppies and cute kittens um, are really a good way to connect with people. Now, I do want to also mention that this, this article is written by a man and um, has a very um, gendered bias to that. So um, I'd also, um, if we're going to be looking at articles that are saying things like that, then we should also be also exploring a counterbalance of um, more feminist-based imagery, which is discussing about how women are um, portrayed in the, in the media. Um, and down here, yeah, we've got plenty of stats. You know, 78% 78 of images of women belong to the young age group under 30. So that's something a really interesting stat. Um, only 10% are medium structured. Um, only 6% are in, in the workplace. So yeah, there's a huge um, work that needs to be done with how we're portraying people um, and definitely um, gender and people of diversity in our images. And I think it's important for mainstream, also not-for-profits to start pushing this because it's very influential in culture. Um, and I am starting to see it in mainstream culture a little bit, but still there's a really long way to go because they just do default to the attractiveness bias as their, um, of their strategy. And I think that's really lazy and weak strategy. Uh, another thing that we need to also um, deal with sometimes is um, upsetting imagery. 
So Animals Australia is a really good case study. They are um, you know, dealing with issues of animal cruelty in a very extreme way. They've got some really horrible images of that. Um, if we're talking about the West Popper campaign, there's some really horrible imagery coming out of there, uh, anti-war, that sort of stuff. So it's really, you need to, if you're, your campaign is involved in um, confronting images, then you really need a very strong strategy on how to manage that. Because people um, don't want to look at these images. Even though it's, it's important for people to see images um, and to learn from that and then hopefully be emotionally connected to do something, the issue is that um, they will simply skip them and scroll them. A lot of the social, like Facebook, will block, block certain images, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so in that context, if you are using upsetting images, then it's really important to warn people. So you may have a, a less controversial, uh, less um, image that's not so um, hardcore. And then you might say, hey, like it gets worse than this and click through. Uh, I've seen where people have had um, blanks and you kind of scroll through the blanks to see the bad image. Um, and I think, um, Animals Australia, if you ever get a chance to see one of their um, communication and, and content um, lectures, then I recommend you go there. Um, I, they're very influential to me on how to do, how to do this. Um, they're a team of I3 and they're uh, getting the results of equivalent of about 30 people in a normal NGO. Uh, and they're dealing with these issues. Um, and we also have a quick look at their website in a bit later. Um, I also want to talk about when we're portraying emotions, um, the happy versus green steel. And green steel is a term that we used to, we use in activism when we're posing for photography. Now, if you've seen the movie Zoolander, it comes from there. Um, and his, um, his weapon, his look, his, um, is the blue steel. Um, now, we translate that to the green steel. So if we're talking about a forest being logged and there's a, hot, there's a, there's a group of people and they're all sitting there smiling and happy, then that's, that's not, that doesn't, doesn't really work with our messaging. So we'll have like a face where we're like serious. We're not, um, we're not sad or um, angry. We're just like, it's, this is serious. Um, so generally photos of happy people, smiling people, um, people will resonate with better. Um, so try to use more happy, smiley images. But then it's also important other times not to use it. So when we did group show photos, or usually when we're doing most photography, we would do a happy shot and a green steel shot, um, and then some stuff in between. And then depending on the narrative that we're, we're using later or what's more appropriate. Um, you know, if you've got someone that's talking about uh, animal cruelty, you actually don't want them to sit there smiling, even though um, on one hand it will be more impactful, it will just undermine your narrative. Um, how you dress and the characters you use are really important. Um, you know, uh, are you wearing a business suit? Are you, um, you know, dressing in gold costume, et cetera, et cetera. And also I want to talk about a concept that is also coming from grassroots activism it's called fezzes to the back. Now, what we, what one tactic for a campaign strategy is to actually get characters that we want to tell our story. So for example, a local farmer, will have more impact than say a city person or a local indigenous person or, um, or various characters that we think are good for the narrative. And then in that is also this concept that the fezzes and fezzes is a word um, that came from the word feral. So it used to be a very derogatory term, you know, you feral, feral protesters. And then it's been remixed to be an affectionate term, which is fezzes. So we're talking about you know, the stereotypes, you know, um, raggy clothes, dreadlocks, piercings, tattoos, that sort of stuff. And so a lot of photographers want to go, hey, the, the positive characters to the front, fezzes to the back. Uh, and that in, in a pure narrative story is a good way to go. However, I also again, um, want to challenge that, um, that concept because it's usually the fezzes that are actually doing all the work, that are running the campaigns, that are actually doing the hard work, that are um, you know, talking about gender diversity, uh, doing the hard yard to make things happen, hooking the mills, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it's actually a, a misrepresentation to push them to the back. So I also want you that when you've got that urge to follow the strategy that I'm teaching about story narrative to also then go, well, hang on, we also just don't want to push and push people who are also part of the narrative to the back just to make sure we've got our narrative.
This is a, a site, this is a, um, a page I just came up. I just quickly searched. So I have I'm have no um, connection to this um, website. This is just a website that says 25 must follow NGOs in Australia. So let's just open them up and I'm gonna do just a really quick crit. Now this is also just to talk about some of these concepts because it can be a bit dry just looking at Glenn talking in text. Now this is also coming from my bias, um, you know, privileged white man in the city. Um, so apologies uh, if that comes through. Um, but I'm just gonna quickly just like um, create these, these images just to talk about some of them. And I'm just purely talking about imagery. So first thing I see, that looks to me like an ocean, 350 Pacific, okay, makes sense. Um, 350 is written in um, what to me looks like indigenous patterning, uh, which I'd assume is from that area. Um, yep, yeah, cool, that makes sense. I'm coming down and I'm seeing what I'm assuming are two um, Pacific Islanders in cultural clothing. Um, they both got the green steel there, so there's some issues there. Um, they look to be in a native environment. Um, again, I'm just, these are just things I'm guessing from, from imagery. So this is important for you to think about, because if I'm guessing this wrong, then maybe that's the wrong image to use. Um, so in that case, you can test your imagery a bit or just test it on yourself. Um, okay, so here we go. We've got them in the ocean. Um, what I am assuming is a very, is a cultural dress and cultural dance. We are not drowning, we are fighting. Okay, so the fact that to me now looks like a protest, um, they're protesting and so I assume now that this all is a protest, um, cultural protest group. This is without me reading anything. Okay, and again, we've got another image, um, the Pacific Frontline, that sort of language activists use, um, looks dressed, cultural. Okay, so this image does again, looks cultural. Um, okay, so we get the, so that imagery is reinforcing what this org is and who they are and what they're doing. That's without me even reading anything. Okay, Animals Australia, I think um, uh, a key organization to look at for this sort of stuff. So, I mean, most of what they campaign is horrible. So they start with a really cute sheep, um, but then they've got the cute piglets, but they're in the cages. So, okay, so here's the bars. So it's sort of starting to subtly um, communicate what they're about but they're not um, going with a hardcore, and there's the baby eyes, um, oh, in that cute. Um, even though most of what they talk about is actually really horrific and gross and whatever. Um, okay, so there we got animals during COVID, you got a cute little animal. Um, they're using uh, that image of a piggy bank, it's a really good way of communicating a bank. Um, that's a good choice of imagery. Okay, so what do we do? Okay, so cute chicken. This is very emotive. Look, we've got a piglet in a cage, change her fate, give us some money. So this is a really good example of using an emotive image and using it to reinforce the um, call to action. This image tells the whole story. You don't need, like, this is the entire, <laughs> entire story straight there. Give us money, we're gonna help the cute little piglet. Um, you know, and then they're also reinforcing with positive imagery. Um, but then if you do start digging, digging through, you'll, you'll see some horrible pictures on their website. Okay, this one, sorry, I'll skip. That was a bad example I looked at before. Australian Koala Foundation. Well, look there, we've got cute, cute um, koalas. Dr. Koala, this makes sense. Okay, so coming down, here we go, human. and. Uh, while are connecting with a human. We're using a, a map to show population. This is a good way to communicate, like where is the issue, um, et cetera. Now we've got people doing stuff. So this is also using images to show what they're doing. They're measuring a tree. I'm assuming that's got to do with helping koalas. Um, okay. This promoting literature in Papua New Guinea. And again, I haven't seen these sites before. Okay. That to me, as a guest, looks like a classroom in a, in a low socioeconomic um, area. Okay, literacy in West Papua, that makes sense. In Papua New Guinea, sorry. Now, this, this website, I think, is a really great example of, uh, you talk about image quality. Now, here on the right, we've got a bunch of school kids. Uh, that to me makes sense. This is about education. Look at all the happy kids at school. So they're reinforcing the good work. 
happy good kids doing stuff this one's a really good image because it's oh they look like um people of culture like the children are dressed in cultural dress then we've got um you know some stuff that you'd see at a schoolyard now if you look at this photography it looks like a shot on an iphone on a on a mobile phone to me this really reflects the brand really well because to me this to me looks like a an organization that's not spending heaps of money on slick marketing um just my subconscious is that the money's going to the schools um and so this really reflects them as a grassroots group um the use of like the cheap photography actually is saying something um you know this looks like someone's just gone over there with their phone and taken photos and i think it works really well because what the photos are doing is they're really communicating the story um okay so this is now we're jumping back to something a bit more highly uh, polished that's a beautiful logo by the way in color scheme so i'm, I'm really into it now this to me is a complete fail they're uh, white uh, on black. There's just no contrast. That's hard to read. What are they doing there? Their donate button. Now there's donate up there. So if I've just come straight from, if I've come to donate to Bush Heritage, I can see the donate. I can already jump there. But this hasn't given me any reason to donate. Besides the challenging road ahead, the bush will turn to its formal glory. Like, yeah, I know it will. But what are you going to do about it? Why are you asking me for money? Like there is the, the um, text just has no con context. The image is actually distracting from that and it's actually hiding that donate button. Uh, that's a complete fail. Um, however, now we're starting to come down, they're doing it a little bit better. Bushfire recovery, well, bushfire, that makes sense. Really high contrast, so I can really read that. It's popping out. This is working really well now. The COVID-19 update, well, that's always gonna be hard to find an image for. Beautiful King Blue. Um, we're talking about the trees now. Um, talking about the bats, we've got a picture of a bat. Rains, we've got a picture of a wetlands. This is all making sense. So at the, at the moment now, I'm looking at, um, um, th this is definitely about bush and landscapes. They've got a lot of landscapes in this. They're about animals, we've got lots of pictures of animals. Now what I'm seeing here is really slick photography. So their, their photography style is quite different to this. This is more um, shot on a phone, um, grassroots. This is slick professional photography. My assumption would be that they're getting donated by photographers that are really into their cause, or they're just blowing all their cash and expensive photography. I would assume it's the first one. Um, however, this would be aiming at more of an affluent audience, um, their target audience would be more, you know, people with money to donate. Uh, obviously, they're aiming at everyone. Whereas this one here would be more aiming at like just working class families that like really um, value education and can really see, um, you know, really grateful for what they have and want to support kids overseas. And again, I don't know anything about these campaigns. I'm just making this up on the spot, but I'm, I'm going through this exercise to talk about how, how people are perceiving images. And you may be perceiving these completely different, and that's also important because people will perceive these differently. Okay, care. COVID-19 emergency appeal. Now I'm looking at that and I'm, um, okay, here we go. We've got the, the, the green steel, very serious eyes, very emotive eyes. This is a very emotive image. That blue mask, they're different to Australian masks. So I'm just gonna guess straight out that this isn't Australia. And we scroll down. And we're seeing um, and hunger and the stereotyped image of hunger, um, which again is worth deconstructing in an essay of, of um, there are essays about um, uh, called poverty porn. Um, on the right, we've got here um, care branded. I assume they're boxes of stuff that are helping people with um, what I assume would be locals that are um, distributing it. Then we've got um, you know, a happy emotive image, mother and child, and that's linked to the wheel. So give a gift to your wheel. So they've got a grandmother with a, well, I'm assuming a grandmother with a daughter. So they're trying to um, connect to that emotion that an older um, grandmother would have. Women and girls, this picture of a woman makes sense. Lifetime learning makes sense as a, what I assume is a student. Um, healthy lives, that makes sense. I assume that it's, um, Doctor, this is really um, interesting because we've got um, women portrayed as the medical experts, um, which is uh, good. Uh, ending hunger, so they've actually got a, a healthy crop. Um, connecting up, computers, people. 
I'm not sure. A kid playing a tree. Yeah. Um, I'll do one more. So Conservation Council, West Australia. So we've got a big, vast landscape. I would, I would put a, I'd mix this more with a call to action. Um, yes, it's great image um, and it connects well, but I think it's just missing. Donate over a cute um, image. Again, why am I donating? Like, give me something here. Volunteering, this is a great image because it's showing local people doing stuff. Subscribe, like why would I subscribe? There's no reason for me to subscribe. All right, I'll stop there. I can keep going. Um, but I think it's important um, and as a homework exercise is to just to even grab this list or just jump through some of your favorite websites with different um, eyes and start just creating the images and try to figure out what the website's about without, um, without actually reading anything because a lot of people don't actually read stuff and that's quite important. Okay, so now I'm going to jump into a stale topic, but one that's really essential. And that's the legals of license of legals and licensing of imagery. And I think it's really important um, to understand these rules if you want to play by them. And it's really uh, important to learn the rules if you want to break them. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Now, before I start this section, I want to make it really clear that I'm not a lawyer. I've no legal qualifications of any kind. And um, this is definitely not legal um, advice of any, any shape or form. This is opinion. And you need to, if you are dealing with any legal issues, actually speak to a legal professional. And I say that because it's illegal to provide legal advice if you're not a trained legal professional. So I repeat, I'm not a legal professional. Okay. So I'm just going to talk about the different legal licensing um, frameworks and, and how that affects you and, and how you can um, work within them. And uh, the first one is copyright. And you would have heard of copyright. And the idea of that is um, it was originally set up to protect artists so that they could, um, they could um, use their creativity. Um, people wouldn't steal it. They could then use the income from that to create more stuff. And it was a way to support artists. Um, from a person who uses that, that is the, the idea is that you need permission to use it in any way, shape or form. If you want to use this picture here, you need permission. Now, copyright in Australian law, at least, defaults the artist. So, so I don't need to put copyright flame writer on there. I don't, any artist that produces any graphics, photos or anything doesn't need to write this as copyright. It is automatically copyrighted. So if you see an uh, image or a painting or anything, it is automatically copyrighted um, and you need to get permission to use it. Um, now, unfortunately, a system that was originally designed to protect artists has just been taken over by corporate. Most, most creative um, outcomes are now no longer owned by artists, they're owned by corporations. Um, and then they started to do dodgy stuff with that. So, for example, there was a law, um, copyright ceases 50 years after the person's death. So they're like, well, they make money during their lifetime and then their children inherit it and they need to make money off it for 50 years. I disagree with that law. I think it should end um, um, after a set period of years, a shortened period, 10 years or something, at very least um, their death. Now, when um, Mickey Mouse, Goofy, Scrooge McDuck came um, into public domain. They did come 50 years after Disney's death. About a year before then, the Disney Corporation in, um, with the American government changed the copyright laws to extend it another 25 years. So Disney, who made most of his um, story, most of his movies, Snow White, um, et cetera, was him grabbing um, existing culture, existing stories, existing story, um, fairy tales, and he remixed them in Disney's way and then um, created culture. Disney now is preventing artists these in, in a contemporary environment from doing that. Now, um, we should be able to use Mickey Mouse and remix Mickey Mouse um, in the public domain. However, anyway. The next, um, uh, so, so usually when we're talking about old fashioned copyright, um, and I will call it old fashioned, um, the more corporate approach to it, is that if you want to um, use an artwork, so say for you want to use this artwork, and I'm using that system, it's generally rights managed. 
So I might go, oh, I want to use that picture for my Instagram post. So you'll pay for the Instagram post. Now, if you want to post it again, you've got to pay again. Or if you want to use it on a brochure, you've got to pay again. You're going to keep paying for every use. Um, so if you um, produce, so an advertising agency produces a commercial for you and you, and you um, license it for one run, 10,000 views. If you want to run more views, then you've got to pay. So for a small organization, I would avoid that at all cost. Um, I think that's just an old fashioned model and I just really don't um, agree with it or recommend you use it. The next um, system that comes under that, which is still copyright or rights reserved, is royalty free. So what that means is you still pay for it. So you still pay for the image, but you pay for it once. So if I said, all right, that's 50 bucks. So you pay $50 and then you get to use it for whatever you want, for as long as you want, however you want, within, within realistic guidelines. So you could use it for your brochure, you could put it on your Instagram, you could put it on your website. So royalty free makes sense because then you can actually um, pay for your license, make sure it's legally purchased and then you, away you go. Now there's a lot of issues with this that's problematic. In that context is that it's all rights reserved. So it, it had no scope for people to use it for other uses, like non-commercial use. So then we came um, with Creative Commons. And Creative Commons is um, a way to talk about copyright in a far more um, flexible way. I'm just gonna pull that up. So this Creative Commons means that um, it's, it's a subset of things you can or cannot do with um, your licensing. And I recommend that you consider using Creative Commons in your licensing. For example, my webinars are create a Creative Commons attribution. So that means you can use my content, you can remix it, you can put it on your website, you can do what you want with, you can even make money out of it, um, but you need to always attribute me. So you've got to credit me for the work. That benefits me because if you're using it um, as part of a presentation, then you're crediting me and that, that helps me. It helps you because you don't have to go through the onerous process of trying to contact me, getting permission, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so I'm just gonna jump to the license. This one's just attribution. This one means you can use the content, but you, can sh you must share it under the same license. This one is that you can use it, but you, um, you can't remix it. So I'm like, this is the image, you can't make it pink because it's my artistic vision, for example. Um, attribution, no commercial. That means that if you want to use it commercially, you've got to pay me. But if you're using it um, you know, as a not-for-profit, for example, then that's fine, um, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a really useful um, copyright um, approach. Um, and I recommend if you're producing content to um, consider that. Um, and also when you're looking at using content, then that makes sense. Public domain. This means that all copyright has been extinguished. This happens two ways. One is uh, maybe an artist has gone, well, I think that it's in the public good that this goes out there and there is no restriction. For example, NASA, um, most of NASA's photography is public domain. So um, if you want to have a really cool backdrop of some stars or a space shuttle, you can legally do what you want with it it's in the public domain. And um, so that's really, really interesting socialist approach to copyright by the head of capitalism. Um, but it's really, it really does, um, the taxpayer pays for the science research. So, so the taxpayer's already paying for that photography. So it's really interesting that then they release that to then to be shared for the greater good and new space exploration. Um, okay, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about if you are breaking the rules and just say you just found a random image and that you're just going to uh, put it on your website. And um, yeah, now this is 2020. It is, it's just happening. Everyone's, a lot of people are doing it. So again, that comes back to, again, your brand personality. Do you just rip and rip and remix or do you follow the rules? Um, but then there's the legals and all those things for you to consider. Okay, so I'm going to talk about a little bit about actually getting caught. So this depends on a few things. Like how big are you? If you're Greenpeace and you're running a high profile um, campaign with a stolen image, the chances are the copyright owner is going to see that. So the chances of you getting caught are really high. And then the copyright owner looks at Greenpeace and go, mm, they got heaps of money. Yeah, I'm going to sue them and, it'll be, and I'll get my money. 
So I would recommend that Greenpeace never break, break copyright rule because they're just too big to get away with it. Now, if you're a small grassroots campaign in Cairns and, um, you know, what well, the chance of anyone seeing it? And even if they did, they're like, there's a bunch of hippies in Cairns. Like, what well, are the chances? Like, we're not getting any money out of it. So generally, you'll, you can get away with whatever you want in that context. Um, now, um, and that's also an interesting point by Sally saying that market forces traces over logos and uses a pencil look to avoid copyright issues. I'm not a lawyer. I would, um, my assumption would be that that wouldn't get over their copyright issues. It would sort of help a little bit, but it'd be, it, it, but I think it, it um, pulls that logo now back into their brand personality, back into their, their um, visual style rather than it looks like an ad from Westpac. Like there's, it, I, th I think it just remixes that logo a bit to bring it into the, the Mark Ford's brand um, personality. I'm not sure why they're doing that. It would be good to ask them um, next time I speak to them. Um, but that's an interesting point. Um, now, generally, if if you're just a small group and you do get caught, generally they'll look at two things. They'll, they'll look at one thing. Are you making money? Now, the thing is a lot of cop, cop, copyright law and a lot of law is based on money and profit. So if you're making profit, so just say you grabbed a copyrighted image and you stuck it on a t-shirt and you're selling that image for profit, straight away, that is the main thing they can go you for as far as legal. They go, well, you're making money off this person's art and we're going to sue you. So it's important if you are using um, images on the sly is to not make money out of them at all. I mean, that will be the, the biggest, um, the easiest way for them to go you. Generally, what will happen is if you are using something um, dodgy, um, is you'll get a letter from from a lot from a legal representative saying cease and desist. That means that they're saying stop doing it. Now, at that point, <laughs> they've probably assessed that you've got no money or it's not worth putting a case up. Otherwise, you get a different letter, which is like we're suing you. So, at that point, if you get a cease and desist, I recommend you get legal advice and then follow through from there. At that point you can just simply stop using the image. And then that's what the letter says. Cease and desist says, stop doing it. And so you stop doing it, the problem goes away. Um, I'd still get legal advice still. Um, okay, now in that context though, I still wanna go through talking about some points about respect. First thing is you wanna respect artists. So um, a lot of uh, small artists are struggling to survive. I think it's really important not to be ripping off images of artists. Um, a lot of the um, images that are getting ripped are produced by small artists um, trying to produce, get through, um, or independent photographers, um, independent journalists and that. So please respect these people. Um, yeah, and, and don't rip their work. Uh, in that context, it's not just the artists, the photographers, it's also the people that are uh, represented. So the people. So you also want to have some respect for the people that are in those. So in that context, if it's, uh, if it's, if you're shooting pictures of, of people or models, it's important to have a consent and release form. So in that context, there's two ways of looking at it. one is a legal um agreement to say that you know where where they're giving us permission to use the image so in that context you'll need legal advice for that um, however most of the consent forms i've ever used are more about a respect so it's like saying we're going to use your image like this you're giving us permission we're not going to use your image like that and then we both sign it so it's a bit more of a um you know heads of an agreement rather than a legal contract as such but it gives us an understanding um that's simply because we haven't been able to afford lawyers at that point uh, it, generally though, is if it's a public event, um, it's usually okay to use images with respect. So if it's a protest, you're taking a photo of a crowd. Um, if it's more of an intimate event, then I'd be um, more talking to people to say, hey, can I take your photo? Um, we're gonna be putting this on social media, that sort of thing, just to make sure that you're getting consent um, of what you're doing. Um, and that's really important for a lot of people who have, um, you know, have seen images uh, misused and also value their privacy. So it's really important to respect that. Repurposing intent is also really key. So you may get permission from somebody to uh, use their photo to save the forest. 
Now, if you grab that same image of a person carrying a sign and says, save the forest, and then you Photoshop it going, you know, we hate, we hate the prime minister. That is not the original intent that the person gave consent to, and you're remixing that. So that's also disrespectful because, you know, that person actually didn't say they hate the prime minister and they're not agreeing to that. So also have some respect on how you're using the different images in different contexts. Uh, respecting children. So if you're using children in imagery, then it uh, gets a little bit more complex. Um, there's a lot of laws around this. Um, as a rough guide, um, it's good not to identify children. So if you're taking shots of say them behind, we're not seeing their faces or, you know, images that are more, um, um, not identifying of them, more anonymous. Now, in that context, if you are using children with faces, then um, you must get a uh, guardian permission form um, a release. Um, so this is the same as a consent model release, but it's for children. Um, and again, you be, need to be talking about the, the intent and that sort of stuff. Um, and I'd also be very respectful of repurposing. Obviously, uh, that child... Um, is not mature enough to make political decisions. So you don't want to frame them in ways that they may not understand or have um, future understanding of. Um, and also when you've got um, vulnerable children, um, you know, children that have other unique issues, you need, know, like for example, Australian with ch children with disabilities, then that needs to be treated with sensitivity um, and respect. Also, um, cultural, I'm just going to share screen again. Okay, cultural beliefs and cultural appropriation. Um, and um, I'm, far, I'm definitely not one to talk to this because uh, as a white guy, I'm, I just simply don't have the experience. Uh, hang on, my share is not working. Here we go. Is that the right screen? Okay. Um, so I'm just gonna. I just I did a search, and here's some um, some some links. Okay, rule of thumb for Sally. If there's at least five people, it's okay. Yeah, I think yeah, as guidelines and stuff, it's still just to use good to use your intuition. Like you know, if you're in that crowd, how would you feel about it? Um, so this is a little a piece um, that talks about image and identity. Again, you can link through this on the run sheet. Um, this is about indigenous copyright um, protocols. Um, there's also a lot of cultural um, issues as well. For example, this one's talking about deceased people um, in um, Australian indigenous culture and how to um, yeah, guidelines and things like that. So if you are working with um, people from people of color or from cultural backgrounds, then you need to learn this stuff and you need to figure it out and ask them and make sure that um, that all makes sense for them. Um, and that, that that's culturally respectful. Uh, okay. Uh, so for example, the, this one here, the, um, I wouldn't just grab this image and, and just use it. Um, for many reasons, um, but just the cultural, like, I don't understand this cultural context. I don't understand what they're doing. I'm just completely naive. So for me to grab that image and just whack it in some context, like I'm more than likely gonna stuff it up and get it wrong. So I'd need to get permission from the photographer, but I need to get permission from someone who um, has a cultural understanding um, and connection to what they're doing there. Um, Culture jamming. So this is where we get those laws and just go and use it to screw them. Um, so there's this great Australian book um, that's come out that's got a lot of culture jamming. Um, so culture jamming is where you're remixing their imagery and, and deliberately breaking the law. So you might get the Coca-Cola logo and remix it to look like capitalism. You're criticizing the corporate Coke. Um, and people drink it, and then you may actually, um, they make stickers and stick it everywhere. Um, there's some really good examples in here of Australian culture jamming, um, where people have remixed billboards, um, remixed brands. Um, so it's also important as activists to sort of learn the copyright laws and sometimes just push it back on them. Um, and Banksy has a great spiel about how advertising is there to insult you. So therefore it's, it's, important for um, us to, um, that we have the right to remix it and to criticize it and to um, jam it and destroy it because it's 
it, its intent is, is wrong. I'll just give you a, an example of a, um, a successful culture jam, and this is coming from my memory, um, is the New South Wales Mining, so it's new nswmining.com, I think was the domain. And so they had this pro mining website. So someone registered mining New South Wales. So you can see that they're quite similar words. And um, they ran and they did a culture jam. So they grabbed their website, they remixed the content and, and actually put truth through it. Now, that was um, not very that successful. No one knew about it until New South Wales Mining decided to sue them, in which case they, they sued them and got the website taken down. So what the activists did is they just put the website back up at another location and sent out press releases. Now, the media loves conflict. They love story. And this became a story in conflict. It just blew the campaign up. Because people were told not to look at the website, they all wanted to look at the website. And um, so that campaign went from um, whatever to very successful because they deliberately uh, baited the um, corporates into suing them, created the conflict, and then blew up the campaign. Now, if you're doing that sort of stuff, it can be highly effective, but then it can also have a lot of legal ramifications. One uh, an example is from the lead blockade where a guy called Jonathan Moylan sent a fake press release saying that the banks had dumped the company that was logging the forest that actually dropped their share market price and that resulted in a long court case so there are legal ramifications to so be very strategic with what you're doing okay so back into it so now we've gone through like thinking about images and um some of the legals around our images now let's work out how to like source our images because obviously we're going to need lots of images for our content now, in the kings and queens of content strategy that I ran on Wednesday, on Friday, um, I went through a lot about content production, and that's just generally producing content, like how we're going to produce it, who we're going to do to do it, things to do while we're doing it, uh, talking about quality. So uh, I'm not going to repeat that. So jump back into the kings and queens of content, and, and I'll talk about how to produce content, getting your teams and volunteers to help you produce content. That is the same with content, with um, with uh, images or written content or anything like that. Uh, and then the other um, approach is uh, stock, uh, stock photography. So I'm gonna talk about stock photography. Now it has a lot of cons using stock photography. Um, sometimes uh, you've seen it before. So when I was shortlisting uh, the imagery for this webinar, and I'm gonna go through that in a little bit, um, there was an image that I had shortlisted. Then I saw it later on in the campaign, uh, someone else was using it for their um, promotion. So in that context, it's been seen before and it's not really a, a unique image. Um, a lot of stock is just cheesy and tacky. So I'd recommend like, look at that in context. Uh, a lot of it's American, again, American and cheesy. Um, doesn't look right. Could be repurposed by other people. So the example that I gave that someone's just using it, but somebody may have used it in, an, in a way that's contradictory to your story. So maybe they grabbed that, that stock imagery and they've made it very negative about an issue or like they've put meaning behind that image just for their marketing. And so therefore, when you're using the image, it already has meaning that's outside of control. And you don't even know that that's happening and it's outside of your control. It's hard to get stock photography that just fits quite right. So for example, if we talk about the, um, the school, um, the grassroots school that we looked at earlier, it'd be really nearly impossible for them to get pictures of <laughs> the school environment. Um, it just works better for them to take them. And of course, stock can look really fake. Now the pros of stock is that you've already got an end result. Like if you're, if you're, if you're um, commissioning a photographer, you don't actually know what the photography is going to look like. Yeah. You can influence that of course, uh, but you can actually see the final image ready to go. Um, the cost, you can get them really cheap. It's really uh, quick in your process. So if you've got to get some um, communications out this afternoon, a brochure, you can quickly grab an image from stock and chuck it in rather than having to produce photography. Um, and also you can get bulk volume of stock. Now, by paying more for stock, you can offset some of those cons. 
So for example, some stock uh, will allow you to buy exclusive use. Um, that's more of the high end uh, part of stock. But if you're worried about it being repurposed by others or being seen before, you could actually pay more for your stock and actually get more exclusive licensing. Um, what I'm generally looking at um, when I'm talking about stock is more um, uh, royalty free. So that means you buy stock and you can use it again. Um, some stock libraries will have um, limited use clauses. So you can go back to the legal section, but um, have a look at how the actual image that you're buying is licensed. Because you don't want to buy the image um, not understanding that it's only for one use, then you're using it for one use, and then you use it for something else because it was successful and that's part of your, your um, brand image now. And then um, all of a sudden you're getting um, a legal letter saying that you haven't paid for the use of that image even though you have actually paid to use the image. Okay, so here's some that I've prepared earlier. So if you um, come to go to actionskills.co free resources, or you come to this thing, with, I've got a link to it. Here I've got links to what I call budget stock. Um, so I've got two lots of links. Um, these are websites um, and this is free. So this is if you've got no budget. And um, so all these sites give away free uh, images. So you can use them for free, do what you want with them within context. Most of them would be uh, attribution. So you, um, you link back to the author. Now on this list is also somewhere NASA, which is really uh, interesting because, you know, I'm a big fan of um, NASA's work. Also Flickr, um, the huge file sharing, uh, photo sharing um, software website, they actually have a search function uh, in the advanced search for Creative Commons. So you can search for images that you can use. Uh, also Google uh, search and other search engines have a Creative Commons option as well. So that can help you look for stuff like, okay, there's the NASA one, et cetera. So these are if you've got no budget and you're willing to, um, you know, overcome the cons. The, another um, way to overcome the cons is be creative with how you're using stock. And I think that's the important thing about um, stock imagery is how you can be creative in, in using it and applying it. Uh, this one here is um, the next step up where you, you have some budget. Um, and generally this will just give you a lot more quality, a lot more um, choice. Um, the search engines are usually a bit easier. So for example, Shutterstock, $29 for 10, 10 images. So if you're running a campaign, um, you know, it, 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 you're paying a, a campaigner for a day, day's work, I mean, $30 for the right imagery, I mean, that's pretty cheap. Um, you know, $9, $29 for 30 images, et cetera, et cetera. So look at the pricing. Um, but if you've got the key image, this one's 79 for five images, but if you get the perfect image, um, that totally communicates what you need, is not cheesy, et cetera, et cetera, then um, these are quite cheap. Now from there, there's uh, also a lot more um, stock libraries that will charge you a lot more money. Um, although these lists are aimed at sort of grassroots orgs that don't have um, big budgets. Um, now I also wanna to link to this one, um, Commons Library is a great resource, I recommend it. Um, they are a bunch of geek uh, librarian nerds that um, curate and do all the research for you. And one issue with a lot of uh, not-for-profits we're dealing with, and I've talked about it earlier, is actually finding images that reflect diversity because, you know, white um, people are overwhelmingly representative. Um, so here we go. We've got some um, ways where you can get Australian diversity. Now, Getty um, is owned by Bill Gates. In fact, most of the, most stock libraries are owned by Bill Gates. He's got a massive monopoly over most images. He owns most of the images that are actually copyrighted on the planet. Um, but you know, there's a disability um, collection there. There's international ones there, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so Getty images will be a far more expensive um, stock. But again, if you really need the image, then you'll need to pay for it. So yeah, there's a lot of stock, uh, there's a lot of um, free photography there or really low budget photography. So the problem is that there's just way too much. So how do we, um, how do we actually navigate that? Um, so I'm just gonna go through a process that I use to um, image research. So I do image research for myself. It's also a um, 
service that I provide when I'm building websites. And so this is the, the basic approach what I do. First thing is I always need a brief. Um, and you'll notice before I do anything, is I need a brief for anything. I'm doing some tech, some software, build a website, um, researching images, I want a brief. So what is your brief? Oh, we want some um, images of people in an event, um, doing this, doing that, whatever. The brief should also go, what are you trying to achieve with the images? So it might be a hero shot and we want people to click on the button or we want, um, we want people to feel trust and then they want to donate, et cetera. Uh, and a style guide is really important. We talked about style guide before. Um, and a budget, how much have you got to spend? So you might go, we've got no money. That's fine. Um, so I'll look at all the free photos. Um, if you've got a couple hundred bucks, then that's great because then I can start looking at the higher end stock for uh, well, the low end of the paid stock photography, uh, for example. Uh, and, and any samples that you can give me as well is really helpful. So you might, um, you know, here's some photos that we've liked. We've, we've just gone on Google and, and at that point, if you're using photography just as samples, then you don't need to worry about copyright because you're not going to be publishing them. So you can just um, start collecting a bunch and go, I really like that image because of that and I like that image. And, you know, we don't know who took them, so we don't have permission, but can you find someone like that? Um, so that's really helpful because then I can visually see straight away what you visually want. Then what I do is I go through lots of, I go through the sites and I start um, shortlisting. So an example, um, so for me promoting the webinars, um, this was my shortlist. So basically what I do, I can open up some of these. So what I started with was I wanted pictures of people on laptops. Um, because webinars, computers, that sort of thing. And that's actually really hard to find people um, to do that. Um, so here was, here's just some of my research. So I looked at lots and lots of images. And then I this is my short list. So you can see there it's a list of images. But I'm, the reason I'm keeping the, um, the link, not just the image, is because if I do want to use the image, then I can credit the author. Or if I need to pay for it, I can do that. Um, sometimes I'll take the image and the link, but always try to keep the link with the image so you can chase that up. Um, so this is using um, graphics. Um, so it's really hard to find non-cheesy images with laptops. Da, da, da. I mean, this to me is a bit cheesy. It's not very strong. That to me is stereotypical. Um, I don't like what that cup's communicating. That's different, but Nah, um, yeah, nah. Okay, this is cool. Someone in um, in NASA that's in a space shuttle on a laptop. Okay, so I'll show you the ones that I did choose. Um, so this one I ran um, an add on. Um, so this is, um, it's an interesting image, just straight out. Um, there's a laptop involved. It's also interesting because we've got um, a female um, astronaut, which is also, you know, challenging that gender stereotype. And I, I made some slogans saying, you know, you can attend my webinar anywhere with internet, including on a space station. It looks techy, it looks high tech, it's sort of fun, um, et cetera, et cetera. So um, that one worked really well. The main one that I used was this one. Now I used it um, mainly because it was just abstract. Um, it's cutesy, it shows what we're talking about. You know, you've got a webcam. Um, and owl's got a lot of symbolism. I use owl symbolism quite a lot. Um, why is it's an animal, nature, um, et cetera. This is a nice little sculpture. Um, so I ran with this one as well. And this one, there's one I shortlisted, but then rejected. And with this, I was looking at, you know, the COVID thing with the masks. It didn't quite feel right for me. Um, so at that point, I've got a shortlist. And then I, then I can, um, can select stuff. So generally, if I'm working with other people, I'll show them that shortlist and then I'll get them and generally I'll group it as well. And then I'll get their, their feedback on that shortlist. They might go, yeah, I really like, uh, just hang on the sirens in the background. I really like this one, uh, this, this group of images. No, nah, that group of images, no, nah, no way. Da, da. So then um, once people can see what images, then once you've got that shortlist, then you can go back and then re keep looking for more of those images that, that fit with that, um, that cycle. And then at some point you select images you're going to use. So that's just a, a very um, basic um, image research um, process that I use. 
um, two way through the huge amount. So the first phase is like sometimes you can do it while you're watching TV or when you're like vagued out because you're just like trawling through lots of images. And it is good to sort of have half attention because um, when you've got half attention and something grabs your eye, that's generally a good thing. If in social media, people are half dopey and then um, something grabs eye. So I do actually think it's good to do that initial research in a set, not in a hundred percent focused state because part of it is just what grabs your eye, just something about it just grabs that. Um, but once you're starting getting to shortlisting um, and you're getting to, to the, the, the tail end of that process, then you're really looking at a lot of details and you're really focused on what type of, what image you're actually grabbing and getting and using. Um, okay, so directing image production. So, okay, you've got some budget and you're able to produce some images yourself or you've got a volunteer or you're shooting it yourselves. So in that context, if I was like, oh, you said, oh, I'm going to go visit the school, the um, school that we saw in the, um, in the examples, I go, oh, great, can you take some photos while you're there? We need some photos for content. And, and you go, yeah, sure. So the first thing I'm going to do is write a brief to say, well, I want some shots of some kids over a desk and I want some shots and I'd have a reason why I want the shots. I want some shots um, of, of them with some stuff so I can put on the donate page and, and da da da. And then I'll, I want you to just freestyle and do some shots. Da, da, da. So I, I'd definitely brief someone in that context. Or if I'm going to spend the afternoon um, with some people, I want a brief. I can share that with people so they know what we're doing, that sort of stuff. So of course we need a brief, we need a style guide, we need a budget, it's the same as before. References, and then we want to brief our creatives. Now I went through a process of briefing creatives in the strategic communications webinar, so I'm not gonna um, repeat that, um, but there is a bit of art to um, briefing creatives um, and learning how to work the best with creatives. So it's really important that you, if you're producing images and you get this uh, professional photographer, and they come in and you just don't go, well, magic me some photos because they, it's luck whether you'll get the right images. It's really important for you to, um, to actually brief and to really communicate what you need and what you want and what you're doing with them. It's also important to let them have space to be creative and to, to do what they do. And different creatives, some creatives on really clear structure, you're pretty much creative directing them and, and telling them what to do. And, and you know, you're directing the shot with other photographers. You give them a good brief and a good framework and they'll do their own thing and they'll do their magic. So it's important to also work out how the creative is and how to do that. But yeah, we talk a bit more about that in the strategic comms um, webinar. Okay, so I'm gonna do uh, now move to um, you producing your images and videos. Because um, there's a few reasons. One, budget, you don't have endless money. But, but the other thing is um, you might be at the right place at the right time. And I gave an example of my favorite image from the lead where two women dressed up in um, Batgirl costumes, they hung upside down off a coal loader. Such a rock star image. Um, I totally love it. Um, it was shot with one of those crappy old Nokia um, flip phones. The image quality is awful, but they were the only ones there. They took the photo. So sometimes you're the only one there or it's more appropriate for you to take it. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about um, what you want um, for a mobile phone production kit. Now the good news is most modern phones, if you're buying a phone in 2020, um, 2018, if, you've, if you don't have much, if budget's an issue, I recommend you, you buy a model back from the latest because the latest is always the most expensive, like by far. And if you go just one year back, you'll still get like last year's technology, which is awesome. It's heaps cheaper. You still get the warranty and all that stuff. So most mobile phones these days have really good cameras. So that's all you need. Um, yes, it's great to have, be a professional photographer with the fancy cameras and stuff, but okay, we're, we're doing this low fi So a um, contemporary photo. Um, then what we want is a selfie stick. And yes, my partner gets really embarrassed when I pull out the selfie stick. Um, now I couldn't find my selfie stick, maybe she hit it. So um, selfie stick looks like, just to show you. Now the one I'm, I recommend that you look at is one with a tripod because that allows you, like having still images really key. So you can use it as a selfie. Now selfies are really key if you're talking to point and you've got the right background behind you. 
Um, so for example, I saw this great film that was, it's coming out at the moment from the Tlangi Treehouse where um, a young uh, woman's um, sitting in a tree sit and she's talking about um, her experience up in the tree. And to have that selfie stick to just frame her face well and then frame her background just works really well. So it's as embarrassing and daggy as selfie sticks look, they're really key, really um, important to getting that shot if you're in it. Also, if you're in it with somebody else in an interview context, um, then you can also use it as a tripod. Um, and some of these other ones have tripod ones. So the other benefit of, of these um, selfie sticks is usually they have a remote control. So that means you can put it on a tripod and you can come back with a, um, with a subject and, or you can be in another location, maybe directing people, that sort of thing. Um, and a microphone. Wind, um, bad audio, and we just heard the fire engine go past. I'm not sure if you heard that, but um, bad audio is the worst thing. Um, studies have shown that dodgy wind and static is probably the, the thing that gets people to stop watching videos. So you really want to make sure you're cutting your wind. If you're outside, it's a windy day, you're going to struggle. So maybe you take your visuals and, and do your um, audio inside. If um, now a microphone, even a cheap microphone, so this one here is I think 30 bucks or something. This is um, a locally um, designed one for road. Um, I've got one here. They work really well. Um, but again, you can do your own research on microphones. If you can plug it in your mobile phone, the most in, the first thing I'd buy if you're doing video on um, yourself is a microphone. It really will improve it. It will in decrease the wind cut. Now, if you are in a situation where you must be in the wind, um, you must be in the wind and you can't, like, that's just the way it is. So maybe try to work out a dodgy um, way to, so maybe you put cardboard out of the shot that's like blocking the microphone or somehow trying to block that wind. Um, wind noise is the most annoying thing and it will, um, um, it will disconnect people from, um, um, background noise, all that sort of stuff. Also, if you're uh, at an event or um, you're, you're producing imagery in this sort of context, communicate with people around you. Say, can you give us five minutes, get our shots, get up, and then, you, and can you be quiet or not swear over while we're trying to um, take our shots, et cetera, et cetera. Audio is really key. Okay, so this, that to me is, is, is an awesome 2020 um, video and um, photo production kit is simply a phone with a selfie stick and a microphone if you're doing film. Bam, you're there. Okay, so just say you want to go a little bit more hi-fi. Um, this here I bought from an op shop for five bucks. It's a tripod. Um, bam. The other thing that's sitting on here, oh no, it's not sitting on here, is this is a mobile phone adapter. So there's screws on the top of there, which allows me to put my mobile phone on the tripod. Now my selfie stick comes with one of them and it actually, uh, see that's a standard screw thing that cameras use. Try get your selfie to have one of them because that means I can use my selfie camera adapter, um, my camera adapter to work on this tripod. So it just means I need one less bit of kit. Um, phone adapter, yeah, battery pack. So these are pretty standard battery packs. Um, you get them from like local shops online. Um, this is just allow you to run out of charge. If you're at an event or out the, on the road, your phone might go flat, um, your selfie stick might go flat. So this is key. Um, USB hub. Now, whenever I've gone to an activist event or any other event, and we're like, everyone should take their phone. And then everyone's charging their phones and they're charging their battery packs and there's no power plugs. Now, the power plugs, they're not actually needing the power plugs, they're wanting the USB. So I plug that in. So that allows me to grab someone who's plugged in, I unplug them, plug this in, I um, put their plug in, I put my camera, my battery pack, and that gives another two holes for somebody else. And I always put my name on it. So, um, you know, things don't go walking. Then the next step is more phones. So uh, if I'm shooting um, something, it's it's a secondary camera is always really key. So if you can get a, another phone and another, um, you lend it off a friend or if you, you can get another one, uh, another tripod. So if you're interviewing someone, you can have one angle and another angle, um, or if you're at an event, you can get different angles, etc. 
And then if you're really going to start upgrading what you're doing, um, then start looking into battery powered portable lights um, because the photography is a, a artwork of lighting. It's all about the light, um, especially if it's in um, low light or problematic lighting. Um, this will allow you to um, help light it up. Uh, and the thing is just to go out there. So just go out there and start um, playing. Um, the, start learning the photography settings on your phone. Um, start shooting um, when, it's, when, when you don't need to. I mean, you can just delete photos. Um, or that storage is cheap. So um, not like in the, when I was a kid when film was expensive and processing was expensive. So you can just practice and practice and practice. It's not costing you anything. Um, and it's always handy if you've got um, photos of your family and friends and stuff. It's, you can never have too many of those. Okay, so um, event-specific photography. I've, I'm a big fan of more, more cameras, the better. Um, now, training helps. So if you've got a, a group that's at a protest or at some sort of, um, uh, you know, a social event or um, something like that, the more people with cameras, the, the more chance that you'll get that exact shot. So um, I was at IMARC and I took some footage, the exact angle, I was up high of a police assaulting um, one of the protesters. It was the only shot out of all the cameras there. It just happened to come from my camera. But if you've got 20 cameras that are watching that, then we're gonna have 20 angles, we're gonna have people are gonna see different things. Um, it's interesting how many, how much time that where we didn't get a shot, of something it's really important and then someone goes oh i've got this dodgy version i'm really sorry it's dodgy and we're like thank you you got the shot like yay um so the more so when we're having events we want as many people as possible to get their phones out and start taking photography um because even if they're bad at it it's a bad shot um if it's the only shot that, that is telling the story you want to show then it's the only shot I had one of my artworks as well um, of a uh, phoenix flying on fire and there was one person that got the shot. Only one person out of them. There was like 30 cameras on that thing um, and she was apologetic of the quality and I'm like, you're the only one that got the shot. Thank you. Um, yeah, and training your crew helps. Like, so teaching them um, on the basics. Lighting. Again, photography is, a, is an artwork about light. Um, and if you're, um, so I recommend if you can shoot at dawn and dusk, that's when the lighting is the most beautiful. The reason is, is that when the sun comes up, it, um, it, there's too much light coming and it starts bleaching and, and um, bleaching out your colors. Uh, or if it's overcast, um, it'll, cut, it'll cut that, that effect, but then you're not getting the, um, all the wavelengths coming in. So the color's getting affected. So if you can get on a sunny day, dawn or dusk, that's when the, the light is at its optimum. So I um, always recommend shooting at those times. Now at that time, you'll also have long shadows coming because the, the sun's on, on such an angle. So also account for the shadows. Um, also with your lighting, just pay attention to um, warm and cool. So uh, I forgot to turn this on earlier, but besides the shadow, it's dropping on me. See my skin tone here is like a lot more cool. And now I'll put that on. Now that light is an LED, just a house light, um, but we've, it's a warm LED. So that means it's got a bit of yellow, uh, sorry, a bit of red in, in a red wavelength. And you can see how the effect on my skin, how it's um, a little bit more, more of a warm color. Um, so that also, so if, if it's a sunny day out here, cause I've got the a window behind me and the blinds, then I don't have that light on cause the natural light will be warm enough. The moment's overcast, so that means the, the blue wavelengths through the clouds are affecting the lighting and making it much more cool. Um, framing. So it's important. Um, okay, so this is back to visual communications. Um, there is a subset of, of photography. So I recommend that you go to the library and get some photography books out to teach you about framing. Um, again, you can look at pretty pictures, it's great. Or if you go to secondhand bookshops or op shops, if you buy film um, from the era when they had film photography, 
um, everyone threw out the books, the books on film photography, because film doesn't matter. But most of those books have huge sections on um, the basics of framing, lighting, and how to take really good photos. So they're really relevant. I've got a few of them on my bookshelf. Is um, books I picked up that have really wealth of information that just you just skip the bit about the film because um, we're using digital. So you, with your framing, you want to um, think about what story you're trying to tell. So we talked about that. Um, we talked about that um, the image of the um, people in, I assume, indigenous dress on the canoe at the beach. That's telling quite an important story. Like, what story are you telling? Uh, landscape. So it's interesting. Greg just said rule of two thirds is a great, great starting point as well. So the rule of two thirds, and I'm using it in this image here, is that if you um, cut your land, your horizon. So this isn't a horizon, but let's say the it's the same concept. So we've got the grassy bit and then we've got the tree bit. So that could also just be a hill and the horizon and the sky. So if I put that at the center, that's a boring image. Um, it just is a far more interesting, and this has just evolved through many, many generations of um, image making, is if you cut it to a third. So have a look where your horizon is, or in this case, just the, the um, transition, and either put it at one third or, or third down. And that also works for sideways as well. In your compositions that that is a huge thing um and in that context i've also taken a little bit further in this image is because um i've also used that mark to separate down the bottom um is sort of two parts of the sculpture and i'll show you the other half a bit later where there's a seesaw down there and then um so i've also split up the sculpture because i'm communicating that it's two different bits by using that line there um, lighting, we've talked about. Um, lighting's really key. Um, sunglasses. Take the sunglasses off. Now, when it's bright and sunny, I love sunglasses. I wear sunglasses. They're good for your eyes. Um, however, sunglasses in photography suck. And um, there's so many photographer photos where we've got great shots and we just can't use them because someone's got um, sunglasses. Now, in real life, they make you look cool. In, in photography, they make you look shady and dodgy, especially if we're talking about, um, you know, doing activist work and we're, we've got pictures of a local community doing something or we've got someone like out in the landscape, you know, helping the animals and then they've got sunglasses on. Get rid of the sunnies. Um, what expression are people using? We talked about the green steel before and this happy smile and then the backdrop. Um, what's behind so I talked a bit about that um, I actually went through lots this is a special type of background um, it's a 3d environment one so it's, it's a, taken on a 3d camera plus there's heaps of dark lighting data and da 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 um, and I went through heaps of them before I could get the right one to get the right backdrop for the composition so what's behind is really important um to your shot and tells a story so there's many times that i'm, I'm about to take a shot and i go oh can we move over here and i'll move people over a few meters and then i'll because uh, of the background slightly better and then i'll go oh, hang on hang on let me just go down um also don't be shy to get on your hands and knees and lie down um a lot of people find it unflattering if you shoot below and so like shooting up like so but um, oh, a better example would be like that. Um, but depending on what you, the story you're trying to tell and um, how you're framing it, that can be really important. We take ladders to protest sometimes because getting that high shot really is good to, get, um, or I'll climb up on things um, if I can find something. So it helps get more in the shot, but also a top view um, can show more, et cetera, et cetera. So start playing with um, where you're standing, how you're framing, etc. Okay, so in the thick and the exciting thing of events, it's really hard to follow the next rule and it's important, is keep it still. Um, shaky, shake, shake, if things are shaking, it's really awful to watch, right? Uh, so we, we don't, we really don't want any shake. This is why we use a tripod or the selfie stick um, in tripod mode. Um, sometimes you may just also just have it like that. So just that sits, or you'll see photographers just with a single monopole. Um, at least you're anchoring it to the ground and it allows you to, to keep, keep it still. If you don't have a tripod, that's fine. So also use your body to brace. So if I've got the camera, I want to um, put your arm in like that. So that, that bit's not waving around. So like that. 
and then brace. So we've got a triangle there. So that's really quite, so I'm bracing down here and then I'm also using this arm to brace. So then I'm really still, I can take my still shots. Or you may lean against the pole. Um, as many times you'll see me taking photos, I'm leaning against things because I'm trying to get as still as possible. The modern phones will, um, will correct um, blurriness, but the, the stiller your camera is, the sharper the shot you'll get. And if you're doing anything, if you're doing pans, now if you're doing video, pans are really interesting. Um, you can pan to different parts as part of your narrative. It's just visually interesting. Um, pan slowly. And I struggle with this because when I'm panning, I'm like, I just want to pan fast. But when I see the video, it's just annoying. So pan really slowly. This should be on a tripod though, so you can use your tripod pan. But even if it's handheld, um, slowly, slowly, um, that's important. Um, because you can speed video up and it's easier to speed video up than it is to slow it. Um, okay, so Sally, has, um, her and her partner do a lot of events, photography, photography background. So I'm just going to read through what she's written. She's got a lot of experience. Turn up early, shoot main people. That is really good points because when things get busy, the main people may be too hard. Shoot placards. So that's more of a protest context. Um, but they make interesting photos. Um, and you also find that if someone's got a really funny or a good placard, then um, it, it shares a lot really well. Shoot close-ups and wide crowd shots. Yeah, shoot at least 20 images of each speaker. Yeah, so you can get great expressions in hand. So out of the 20 shots, there might be only one that's usable. So yeah, I'm a big fan, more shots, more shots. And when I get my partner to take photos of me and stuff, she'll take one photo. And like when I'm taking photos, I'll take like 50 of them. Because out of one shot, um, you know, it's that one shot that really stands out. It's better to have too many than not enough, right? For fisheye lens. Yep, so you can get fisheye lenses for phones. Um, yeah, and, and do a recce. So a recce is a reconnaissance. Recon reconnaissance oh, I can't even pronounce it. It's where you go early and you scope out where the event's going to be, where people are. You're going to go, okay, so this would be a good shot. Um, where can I put a ladder or where can I stand? And sometimes you, you, if you're speaking to the event organizers, go, well, if I'm looking at this framing and this here, and this where the sun's going to be at this time of day, I reckon the crowd, like this shot's what we want. So can you move your stuff over there, please, for the photo? And some event organizers will be like, go away. This is our event. And others will understand the photos are key. And some events we've run, we've totally laid everything out around what the photography looked like. We've done um, direct actions where like, the entire motive is to get a photo, and so everything's around that photo. Um, yeah, so recce is really early, um, really good advice as well. Um, okay, so you also need to think about what resolution you're shooting. So this is how big the image is, or how many pixels are in each image. So in an ideal world, you'd want highest res as possible. Now there's a few drawbacks to having as high as res as possible. One is that Sometimes it'll slow your camera down, so it takes longer to shoot. So you might want to take a lot of quick shots, something exciting's happening, and you're waiting for the processor. The other thing is that it may fill up your data card really quickly. Um, uh, and then the other issue is like managing the data if you're when you've got your, your uploading to the internet or all that sort of stuff. So the bigger the file, the more pain it, painful it is to manage. However, the bigger the file, the better it is for later because when you, you can always, it's better to size an image down, but you can't increase the size of an image. So the, you need to balance it. The bigger the image, the better for later for using the image. Um, uh, it's also the higher res, the better for image correction and all that sort of stuff later. Um, but then the more painful it is to manage. So you need to decide that before you start shooting, like how big am I going to shoot them? Or you might shoot some shots and then drop the resolution in your camera, shoot some shots, increase resolution, that sort of stuff. And then another really uh, key point I find that's important is that once you've done your shot is to then shortlist them. If you're running a campaign or you're doing different events, the thing that's really annoying is that if you go, oh, I really need a photo from that event, like it'll be great for what I'm, from what I'm doing at the moment. And then you go and there's a folder of 100 photos or 200 photos. Like, oh, do I really got to go through 200 photos to find the one? Whereas if you've got a shortlist, like the 10 best photos of the day, you can go, oh, I'll look in there. 
bam, that's a great file, use that photo. And it's only if the photo that you're looking for is not in there that then you, have, you can go through the 100 photos. Um, if data management's a big issue, so you may keep 20 and delete the rest, um, all that sort of stuff. And then we're all hypocrites. Most photographers, including myself, just have dumps of photos everywhere, big long lists. And someone goes, oh, do you have that photo? And I'm like, yeah, somewhere. Um, the more organized you are, it's better for you. But if you're working in a team, then I think that's a really important process. Okay, so now I'm going to jump from... Um, and we're a bit over time, um, but I'm going to keep going if that's okay. Um, I'll try and be a bit faster. Um, so now I'm going to talk about preparing um, images for web. So this is the minimum amount. So now we've got the photos. This is what we're going to do to get um, to get them published. This is the minimum you need to do. And I come across all the time, people who aren't managing their images aren't doing these things I'm about to show you. This is the minimum you must do for all images that go on the internet. Now, before we go into it, you may choose to do this with an automatic process. So for example, if you upload to Photoshop, I'm sorry, to Facebook, it'll automatically shrink things down for you. Or will you do it manually using an image editor? Um, there's a few uh, approaches to that. For me, I think it's important if you're all your hero images, your main images on your homepage, the important images all should be manually, lovingly crafted. Because um, there's a lot of variables when you're compressing things and cropping things and doing that sort of stuff. So I, I, like any important image should be manually done. Um, you want to consider the platform it's going on. So for example, Instagram works better for squares. So we'll crop everything down for squares. So that image there, when it goes on Instagram, will be cut to a square. How big is it? The actual file size, resolution. So the higher the resolution, the better it'll look, but then the slower it is. So how fast do you want that image to be? Okay, so the, the minimum things you need to do is to crop, resize, compress, save for web. If you don't know how to do these things, you need to learn um, and you need to learn your software. So I'm just going to, uh, this is Photoshop. Now, these are the basics um, in any app software application. If your software application can't do these tasks, then get, get a different software. I just know this software, so I'm going to um, uh, use this as the example. This is, the, um, this is in Photoshop, but if your software can't do this, which is, crop, resize, compress, save for web, then your software needs to do it. I'm using Photoshop because that's what I know and I'm just showing you the concepts of what I'm doing. Um, but you'll need to choose your own software and then learn how to use it. And I'll talk a bit about that as in closing. So in this context, this is the image of Flappy, seesaw at the bottom, you seesaw up and down, it flaps and swings. I'm cropping this for Instagram in this, con this, ex this example. So this is, um, it's a square format. Instagram works better for square. If not, it just crops it anyway in most formats. So I'd rather crop it than Instagram. Now this image is slightly taller than width. So what I'm gonna do is I wanna control really tightly how I wanna crop the height. And then I'm gonna center, center the width. So it's in the center. So it's at the moment it's slightly wider. And I hit return. So now that's cropped that. Then I'm going to use command for um, sorry, this come across two screens. It gets thing across. Okay, so this is the the pixel size, um, and this is Canvas in this software. They use the word Canvas. So this allows me to crop by pixels. So at the moment, I've got a height of one six seven. So to make this a square, I need to cut the width. So I'm going to go one six eight seven. That will make a square. Now here, I can see if I do that, it will cut it off the right hand side. If I do that, it will cut it off the left hand side. Now, because I've centered the image, I want it off both sides. Okay, so now I've got my square, I've got my proportion. So that's just a introduction to cropping. Now, if you have a look at my um, background there, the two thirds rule, um, not really working there. Um, so it looks a little dull. Um, I'm happy enough with that. I could um, put a bit more, more sky into that if I wanted. Okay, so I've got a crop. Now the next thing is I want to resize. So in this case, I'm looking at the image size. And this image is one six pixels. Now, 
I'm uh, happy with that going up to Instagram. Oh, I usually will um, make things, you know, 1200 is the size of a lot of laptops. So that's the, the screen width of a laptop. So I can probably get away with that in that context. But I'm just going to um, just keep it as it is. 1600 is fine. Now, in that context, I recommend that you find a guide to figure out what size to resize. So if you're um, making this for Facebook, just search for image sizes Facebook and um, that will, they will, um, you'll find what the widths and the heights and stuff are. Sally's just posted them, um, but in that context, um, they change. So search for them. Um, Canva's a great software application because you can just export as file size, or whatever. So, there's my crop and then I can uh, resize that using the image resize. I'm not going to do that in that context. All right, so now I'm going to save for web. And there's three formats that I recommend. Do not use TIFF, that's a print format. JPEG, GIF, JPEG and um, PNG. I'm going to talk about them. GIF. GIF is an old fashioned format. It's still used quite a lot. The benefits of the GIF format is that you can do animated GIFs and you all would have seen animated GIFs, especially on Facebook. So they still have their place. They also can do transparent backgrounds, um, but they can only do um, pixels. They can't do a blend on that background. So on their wingtips, it'll just do a really rough background. So that works for more lo-fi images. Um, that's the GIF format. Um, JPEG, I recommend, is generally the best format for photography-based stuff. Um, landscapes, that sort of thing. And you can play with the different formats. Now, PNG comes in two flavors, 24 and 12-bit. Um, now, the 24 PNG allows transparent backgrounds, but with blends. So if you, got, if you want a transparent background, then PNG is the only format to use. They're usually generally higher in file size. Um, some images like flat colors work better with PNG. So only use PNG, JPEG or GIF. Um, and also Sally's point there is really good of saying that we should um, name your files correctly. So in this case, we're gonna go to JPEG. So this is, um, so your software should do this, crop, resize, saving for web. Now also compression. Now, Basically, the way compression works, it uses it, it deletes a, a, poten, a percentage of pixels and uses fancy mathematics to guess what they are. So it will look at the um, the pixels around it and use mathematics to guess what they are. This technology is getting better, but the more you compress it, the more data you're deleting out of this image. So you can start seeing. I'm not sure if Zoom's giving you the quality, but this is all pixelated and pretty crappy. Um, but then the image size is um, 106K. If I go to 100, nothing's been compressed. That's 1.5 meg, massive difference. Now, Photoshop, um, Facebook butchers your images. They'll recompress it. So I generally, if I can with file size, I'll push it out 100%, bring it into Photoshop and let, I'm sorry, into Facebook and Facebook will then do its compression. Um, if you're not sure what to use, 80 is a good good size because this is 700K. It'll, get, it'll be a good, um, good um, in between file size and compression. Um, some images compress really well. This image is actually compressing well, so I can bring it right down, um, et cetera. So they're the minimum you must do before preparing your, your images for web, is work out what platform and what size you want it, crop it, resize now your crop might be perfect resize save for web compress now when i say on the list compress once don't compress the jpeg and then compress it again because basically you've got pixels missing with mass guessing then you take more pixels out and the mass it just so again um if you upload to facebook they will compress it for you so try not to compress them when going to facebook um and let there let it compress once and then i'll save that let me just show you quickly what color correction could be, look like. So this is where, now the colors, I color corrected this in the software when I exported it, but I may use, say, something like the curves to see see how the colors are changing. So if the, if the image was dark, I could bring it back. Um, 
but yeah, if learn, learning image correction um, is a skill and takes a bit of work, um, but there's an intro. So there's the next bonus skills. I'll switch that off because it didn't improve it. Um, filters. So you would have used Instagram filters or other. Um, so a lot of like uh, Lightroom has filters where you can buy filters or they're built in. So what filters are doing is just doing the color correction in an automated way. So um, you can learn to use filters. Now less is more when you're editing images. So if, if I'll just jump this, um, this back up. So this is all the data in the image. So if I bring this back to here, this slider, yeah, I'll delete that. I'm deleting all the image from the right of that arrow. All the data is getting deleted. So that image is smaller with less data. So if you're making the image look good, that's fine, but you are degrading the image. So the point is that you should only optimize once. Don't optimize a bit, save it, optimize a bit, save it. Because each time you're just cutting the data and um, you're just making a mess of that image. So if you need a, if you see an image that needs to be color corrected and it's already been color corrected, get the original and color correct the original. If you start trying to color correct an image that's color corrected, it's a mess. Same as if an image has been compressed and your compression also removes data and then you're trying to color correct off the top of that, that makes a mess. Um, so less is more when you're doing color correction and always have a be able to see before and after because sometimes you might spend like a few minutes on it and you go, oh, it took me ages, but I got it better. You switch it off and go, no, actually I didn't improve it. Um, okay, so I recommend lynda.com, um, which she got bought out by uh, LinkedIn Learning. Now, they have massive, huge amounts of tutorials on Photoshop and heaps of software. Now, this is $30 a month for unlimited webinars. Um, your time's more important than your 30 bucks. So it's pretty much free. Now, LinkedIn at the moment is got a free month trial as well. So you could do a month of Photoshop training for a um, for free. So I recommend um, learning a bit more about your software application. And um, I'm not saying you should use ph photography. So now I'm gonna just jump to image editors um, towards the end of the webinar. Now, Photoshop is the industry standard. You Lightroom. Now I recommend that, um, like I use it just because it's a professional tool. Now, if you're just going to do the basics, which I've shown you, edit, reduce content, color correct, filter, you don't need something like Photoshop. There are a lot more simpler tools for you to use. And I recommend um, not learning Photoshop. You'd learn Photoshop if you're um, doing something a bit more full on. Um, so if you wanted to use Photoshop and Lightroom, say you're already trained in it, um, if you go to connecting up, you can get a um, sign up. If you're not for profit, you can get a heavy discount on Adobe because um, Adobe is very expensive. Um, but yeah, you can get a huge discount. Now GIMP is an open source version of Photoshop. So it's pretty much 90% of Photoshop in more of a clunky interface. It's free, it's open source, um, it would, it's great. In saying that though, I wouldn't bother learning such a complex tool if you're just doing simple things with it. Um, Canva is a great tool that I recommend. Um, this is an image editor, but it's a bit, it's much more than that. It's like a, it's like a graphic design. It brings graphic design to the, um, where'd Canva go? It brings graphic design to the masses. So it's a drag and drop interface, which makes graphic design much simpler, uh, rather than learning complex tools. It comes with heaps of built-in templates um, and also you can build your templates. So in that context, if I'm running a campaign, I can set up my style guide. I can build templates. I can put my logo in, my fonts, my color schemes. So that means I may have a meme template. So someone can go, I want to make a meme. They can go to the template, drag an image in, put some text. It's already got your font. It's got your brand. It's got your colors. Export to, photo, uh, to Facebook. Done. Um, so Canva... Um, manages all your brand styles, your templates. It makes it easy for non-technical or non-designer people to use it. So it's a great tool to work with teams. Be careful though, because there's a lot of in-app in purchases. Like, like to, you can buy stock in there, but it'd be an expensive way to do it. But also I've linked um, to the free, there is a um, free version. 
So if you're not for profit, you can apply for a free version of Canva. So you can look into that. Now, if you're using images regularly, if you're running your social media campaigns in your website, and I recommend that you spend about 100 to $200 on a image editor. Images are so essential and being able to edit and, and manipulate images is key. So for Photoshop's really expensive, so that's only for the high end. But if you're the next level, now I haven't linked anything there because there's so many of them out there, depending on your needs and if you're on Mac and PC and all that sort of stuff. Um, so I would recommend considering that. Now, if you're on a budget, then I would look, um, I would look free image editors. So there's free images editors out there, um, simple ones. Um, there's one um, library which I uh, haven't linked to, so you'll need to find these yourself, and that is um, image editors on mobile phones. Now, I'm old school and I prefer to do all my editing on a laptop, um, but if you're more mobile phone inclined, there are some really good apps to be able to um, crop, resize, save for web, filter on your uh, mobile phone. Free image editors. So, for example, the software that comes with a Mac will um, crop, resize, save for web. Um, some of these you can upload, uh, you have to upload to a browser, some of them a desktop, etc, etc. So uh, in summary, um, the basics you need to learn about images is to crop, resize, save for web. Um, and I recommend that, it, that if you're doing a lot of images that you actually buy a, a decent software app to do that or obtain it some other way. Uh, if you're really serious about images, you can take the next step and learn GIMP and Photoshop. Um, they are much more complex tools, so I'd only recommend that if you're, you know, you're going to be really serious about your image images. Um, yeah. So that's me to a close. Um, so thank you for your time. I'm um, running these webinars as free, pay as you feel. So um, I really appreciate uh, donations. You can. Uh, the link is um, on the email that I sent through. If donations don't work for you, then please uh, like my stuff on YouTube, on, on the social medias, that helps it to get out there. Um, or I'd appreciate that you share and let your friends know what we're doing. Um, so that way it build, builds up my audience. So therefore I can continue to keep producing free content for activists. So thank you for your time.